Good morning. My name's Yvonne Wassenaar. I'm Chief Information Officer at New Relic. For those of you less familiar with New Relic, we are an all-cloud software application or software analytics company. And what I mean by that is as more and more business is done with software, you want to know how those applications are performing. You want to know what the customer experience is. You want to know what the business insights are. So you don't bank in a retail branch, you bank on your phone. And therefore, what you want to know is how quickly did the app load, where did they go, what's important to them. I've worked in the technology space for a little over 25 years, and it's incredibly exciting to be at New Relic on the forefront of how cloud is changing the world around us. And that's what I want to talk about today, what it means for all of us to work in a cloud-first world, how that's changing the environment, but also what do we need to do to be relevant and really lay the foundation going forward. So I'm going to start with a brief history. And the reason why I want to do this is, you know, we just heard this morning there's been a lot of change. We've talked about the next industrial revolution, but, but where have we really come from? And I want to start with the mainframe. 1950, this was the first way that we actually found the computing power to do transaction processing and massive calculations. These machines cost over $200,000 a month to lease. By 1955, there were only 250 mainframes worldwide. So it was very specialized and, and contained. And then by the time that we got to the PC revolution, this was in the 80s, we had a million PCs in 1980. We had 30 million by 1985. So there was this massive proliferation, but even more importantly, what happened was we went from the context of being very specialized back office transactions to enabling our business. So supply chain management, all your financial systems were all enabled through this next generation. Then we went on to the internet. And we had the e-commerce boom and, and bust. Um, but fundamentally, it allowed a new way of connecting across. And then we went from there, we went to both mobile and cloud. And so it seems like it was a long time ago. We had the BlackBerry that kind of came and went. Um, but the iPhone came out in 2007. And all of a sudden, you had a computer in your hand. That was less than 10 years ago. We had AWS, obviously we had Salesforce and we had SaaS come out a little earlier, but AWS came out in 2006. And these gave us new ways both on the consumer side to engage with technology and to allow us to put technology in regions and places it had never been, but it also gave us a way to reduce the cost of the infrastructure and to make it easier so you didn't have to spend and build big data centers to have great power, you could rent that. And that finally brought us to what we have now, which is the, the digital era. And the digital era is everything from the Ubers and the Airbnbs that are creating new ways to do business to the IBMs and the GEs who are selling off pieces of their businesses, looking to become software companies, AI companies, all of that. And yet, is what, what's more important than the milestones themselves are the trends. And so you go from, it took 30 years to go from the, from the mainframe to the PC, down to 10 years to get to the internet, down to, in the next 10 years in the 21st century, you have two transformational technologies to today. So the comment this morning that it's evolving much more rapidly is incredibly true and incredibly important for us to appreciate. And part of what is happening is we always talk about there's the decrease of cost. Exponentially, it's cheaper to buy technology. It's also exponentially easier to use it. It's easier to access it. When I learned how to program back in the 80s, I learned Assembler and Fortran and Pascal. I mean, I did coding when COBOL was cool. I mean, the, the programming languages, yeah. I'm that old. The programming languages 
today and the frameworks and what you can do is just, it's just so much easier. And my grandmother can use technology. I mean, so we have to appreciate it's, it's easier to build and do new things. It's easier to access. On the flip side, what's happening is we're seeing the proliferation of use cases and expansion of where things can go. And that's because it's so easy. And if we think about it organizationally for all of us in the room, what does that mean? Well, it was actually in the 1980s that the CIO became a real job. So I'm a CIO. Why did somebody create my position? They created it because we were at an intersection of the business now runs on technology. If your financial system goes down the last day of the quarter, that's bad. If you can't transact orders, if you can't ship gear, you're out of business. And that's all now being run by technology. And technology is expensive. You need data centers. You have to spend a lot of money. And so it was at that point in time that company said, hey, I need a single throat to choke. I need somebody who's ultimately responsible. And out of that came the CIO organization. But the big question to ask is that as technology became easier to access, and as more and more people could do it, and more and more people could buy it, a few years ago, I sat around the table and we asked a very important question. We asked, is the CIO dead? I wasn't a CIO at the time, so it wasn't such a personal question. <laughs> but, but I literally, I was at the executive tables at a previous company I worked with, and we sold to CIOs. And we sold to people in their organizations. And we were looking at the budget of CIOs, and the budgets were, whew, they were all leaking out. It was the chief marketing officer, the chief sales officer, who was doing the technology spend. And we're like, well, wait a second. The pockets that we're digging in are getting smaller. And should we start to pivot our sales force? And if you read the papers and if you looked at what was being said about CIOs, I mean, they were in an abysmal state. They were inefficient. They were trying to do more with less ineffectively. And so people were just going around them. Now, fortunately, I'm going to tell you, I don't think the CIO died, because I am one today, so I'm living proof. But the, the, what came out of it was the CIO role itself was very ill, per se. And the reason was the world around was changing. And if you only thought about those things that you deeply controlled, you were controlling less and less, and you would die. So you had to reframe what it was that was important. And out of that came, you can tell I'm a marketer, the new CIO, the chief innovation officer in some regards. And it really was this switch from command and control, drive efficiency for the business, to I'm going to be a strategic partner, and I'm going to innovate for the business, and I'm going to collaborate. And that was a really important shift from a mindset perspective. And it's very true whether you're a traditional CIO, so you look at these large companies that, are, that have data centers, and they're shedding their data centers. They're getting rid of all of that because those CIOs realize that as long as they're burdened with these boat anchors um, of complex, hard-to-scale, hard-to-run technologies, they can't innovate. To people like my company, New Relic, which was cloud-based, which said, hey, you know, for the first eight years of our life, we went public with no CIO. It was great. We just bought Salesforce and Marketo. Like, everybody buy what you need, and it all worked great. And it did for a long time. But ultimately, it doesn't work great when you hit a certain size. So whether you're coming from the traditional world up or from a cloud world down, we're all realizing that while there isn't any more a single owner of all the technology spend, there needs to be an, a steward of the technology in the company. We're not at a point in our evolution that it all just works. And that's what I'm going to share with you a little bit today, is if you want to be a strategic partner in this new era, if you're working in this new era, what do you really need? And so to create impact, 
there's a few things that are critically important. First is being holistic. And what I mean by this is somebody has to understand everything that's going on. Because the, the beauty of the cloud is that pretty much anybody here in this room can bring a new application into their work environment. It's a credit card swipe away. And the challenge with cloud is pretty much anybody in this room can bring a new application into the environment with a credit card swipe. And if security and interconnectedness and budget weren't a problem, it probably wouldn't matter. But that's not our reality. All it takes is one unsecure application to provide the back door for a bad actor to come in and bring down critical components of your business. All it takes is for one person to decide to delete a row and a table in Salesforce to potentially cause a system problem over here. I've lived that experience. It didn't matter to the sales team, but there was some application over here that when it called to get that information, it wasn't there, and it died. And so you have to know how these things interconnect. But the other thing of import is there's a great opportunity to provide value to the broader organization by having that viewpoint. And one of the things that we did at New Relic when I first became CIO a year ago, so I came in as the SVP of operations, we didn't have a CIO. We started to realize that technology wasn't enabling us as fast as we needed it to. We created financial dashboards. And I just didn't look at what spend I had. I went into the financial systems and I pulled out all the information and I said, tell me everything people are spending on technology. And then I was able to go to the chief marketing officer and I said, hey, Robson, look at this. This is how much you spend. Whether it's in my budget and your budget, this is what you spend. These are your top 10 SaaS providers. And you know what he said? He said, wow, what do those two do? <laughs> and why am I spending so much there? And he literally, I, I didn't micromanage what he was doing, but I empowered him to have that visibility so that he and his organization can make better choices. So the first thing is be holistic in mindset. Provide that broader view for security, for compliance, for the integration, for the financial benefit. But the second is to be focused. How many of you think you know how many SaaS applications are in your company? Any idea? How about in a Fortune 1000? Any guesses? The research shows that the average Fortune 1000 company has over 700 SaaS applications. IT usually underestimates that by about 80%. <laughs> At New Relic, because I went through this financial analysis, we guessed we had about 40. Like, you can name the big 10. Everybody knows the big 10. And then you kind of figure, well, there's some others that have snuck in. It's usually marketing and product that are the big offenders. But we had 141. We're an eight-year-old company, like 141. Um, and, and the reality is, is that you can't, I cannot, even if I wanted to manage 141 apps, let alone 700. And even if I wanted to, do you think the marketing guy and the sales guy would be like, hey, you want to manage my world? No, that's what they're running away from. They're like, hey, I want to be empowered. I want to do my own innovation. I want to be nimble. I want to be agile. But Back to this concept of interconnectivity. Customers and partners do not engage with New Relic or any of your companies saying, oh, I just want to talk to sales, and that's all I want to, how I want to be treated. Companies exist as multifunctional groups because it takes a village to serve up value to people. And so what we did at New Relic was to look at, well, how cross-functional are these applications? And what's their business impact? And then to go after the top quadrant, which out of my 141 is about, I want to say 15. And they're the 15 applications that really are what I would call platform applications, like the sales forces of the world. They're broad reaching. Salesforce doesn't just sa serve the sales organization. Salesforce serves the marketing department, it serves the finance department, it serves the product groups. And so you have to look at, at key process flows like um, order to, uh, or sorry, bill to pay. 
You know, what is happening? That's many systems interconnected that do that. Or from lead to opportunity. And a classic example in a company like, like ours that never had a CIO, well, we did the normal thing. You know, sales went out when we were a nice startup and they bought Salesforce and marketing got Marketo and you know, finance got NetSuite. Everybody had their little thing and they were running it. Well, we had a situation where our CEO said, hey, we should have a five minute time from when somebody deploys New Relic product to when a sales rep calls them up. Seems very rational. Research shows that makes a big difference in adoption. So we went and we said, how long does that take? It takes three days. Now, naturally, being a good technologist, I said, yeah, that's because those salespeople are not doing what they need to do. <laughs> However, when we actually broke it down, I will claim a day of that time was getting the data through the various systems. So imagine this, we're in, we're in the war room, and I've got the marketing ops people and the sales ops people, and I've got my team, and we're sitting there, and we're like, okay, great news. The issue is in the Marketo backlog and getting information from Marketo to Salesforce, this is perfect, we've solved it. And I said, who owns that integration? Crickets. Because the marketing people owned Marketo, and the sales people owned, sales, or owned Salesforce, and the integration was just kind of there. And that's the type of thing that you can't have on these big cross-functional processes. You need to have common staging environments. You need to have release management. You need to have management of integration. So a lot of SaaS solutions, a lot of custom cloud development are very point-based. Great, innovate, do all you want with that. But if it's for running the company at large, partner together so that we can deliver impact. The, the next area is actionable. And what I mean by actionable is actionable data, insight. So lots of data, meaningless. Unless it gives you insight, which is still meaningless. What you need to do is actually have action that you can take out of that data. And one of the challenges in a cloud-first world is that you've got data that sits in Salesforce, and you've got data that sits in Marketo, and you've got data that sits in your own cloud. And again, customers deal with you across applications. So to have great insight and to be able to take action, you want to pull that information out. And so you, you could move it from one application into the other, and we've done that for quite a bit and we kind of move a lot of information into one tool or another tool, and they all provide analytics tools. But ultimately, what we've chosen to do, and there's many ways to do it, is to pull that core information out, and we're building out New Relic on New Relic. But really, the important part is, how do you get that insight across applications? And so I think there's a lot of innovation in how do you create that interconnectivity and viewpoint of the data set so that you can get the information to feed action into what is increasingly commoditized process. You also need to have commonality of definition. A customer to a finance person might be who they bill. A customer to a salesperson may be who they call. A customer to the head of sales may be the conglomerate organization. Having the ways to aggregate and disaggregate that information also becomes key. So thinking about how do you create the holistic view? How in that view do you focus on those areas that matter most from a technology perspective in servicing your customer base? And how do you make it actionable is critical. There's one more thing. So I left space on the bottom. You guys thought I was done. I had one, two, three. I'm almost done. But I can't be finished until I talk about it being fl flexible and agile. And the reason is we talked about technology going from being taking a really long time to a shorter time to a shorter time to a whole lot to it's happening all the time. If I were to build out my solutions in a very rigid way, tomorrow there's going to be a great new technology that's going to crumble my entire house. And so part of the importance of having what we've talked about at this conference, this, the APIs, the integration layer, is you want the agility and flexibility to be able to plug and play. As new vendors come up, as new solutions come up, as new technologies are relevant, you want to be able to plug and play those in in a flexible way. 
and you want teams that have agile skill sets, that are great learners, that can actually grow with the technology, because technology will continue to change. So the one thought that I want to leave with all of you is change is the new constant. Change is going to happen. It's going to happen at an increasingly rapid pace that's outside your control. But the good news is what all of you control is where you focus and how you're building the solutions in that world, knowing it's a changing world, to really not only drive impact today, but also to set the foundation for where you're going to go in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you.